Welcome to Destiny Awaits, the podcast where you discover how to step into your identity. I'm your host, Andrea John, and I'm thrilled to embark on this journey of discovery with you. Each episode will explore profound insights and practical wisdoms drawn from stories, scriptures, and personal experiences. From unlocking your purpose to navigating the path toward your ideal vision, we'll uncover the threads that weave together autonomy, identity, purpose, and vision into the tapestry of your destiny. Together, we'll explore the nature of God and the essence of who you are, unveiling your destiny and igniting the spark of transformation. Whether you're seeking clarity, inspiration, or a roadmap to fulfill your calling, Destiny Awaits is your guide to living a life of purpose, passion, and profound impact. Join me as we embark on this empowering journey. Your destiny awaits, and it's time to unveil its magnificence. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Destiny Awaits podcast. I am your host, Andrea John, and I am excited to let you know that in this in-between stage of our podcast, I have decided to do a focus on the Sermon on the Mount. I've spoken about the Sermon on the Mount a few times. Um, It is referenced in my book, The Journey. I talk about it in the chapter called It's All About the Heart. And recently, God has been putting this sermon on my heart. It's been a very busy last week, and part of that included travel. I got to go to San Antonio as part of the Paper Crowns launch party. But also, we were invited as Paper Crown Media to uh, come and speak at an author's forum. Now, for those of you who don't know, I am part of a company called Paper Crowns Media, My role within the company as one of the core team members is also formatting. So I do the interior design of books, and I just love helping authors bring their book to life and demonstrate the heart of their message through the inside of those pages. We have an amazing team. Elisa Farndell is our fearless leader, our CEO, and also the one who creates all the book covers, which are amazing. So all the book covers you have been seeing on my books were actually created by Melissa Farndell, and they are just absolutely amazing. There's a lot that's been going on. I shared a lot of that last week. This Saturday, we have the launch party in Jacksonville, Florida. So if you are local and would like to attend and are female, you are more than welcome to do so. Sure, it's a party to celebrate in his image, but really it's going to be a party to celebrate everyone who is coming because we are going to talk about your dreams, your aspirations, what you want to do, what the next steps are, what's been holding you back, and hopefully put you in touch with someone who can help you Turn your dream into reality. Next month, uh, Breaking Free is going to be launching. It is a fiction book about Sarah and her two daughters and how they escaped a life of abuse and are now living in the light and hope of God. So with that, all of that stuff's been happening, and I was going to take a break from the podcast But I don't know, the Sermon on the Mount has been so heavy on my heart. And this week while I was traveling, it was just beating, beating on my heart. And I woke up on Saturday morning and before I did anything, I decided to read through the Sermon on the Mount in the Message Bible to see what God was trying to say to me. And I shared a video last week when I did this. It was very uncomfortable. I read it in the message translation. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's more of like a paraphrased translation. It was encouraged to read by some scholars who feel like if you don't really understand the Bible that much or you're new to all of this, the message Bible is really a great way to understand the concepts. It puts it in today's language. It's just so easy to understand. I did not realize how much more relevant the Sermon on the Mount would be by reading it in this translation. It was uncomfortable because I know the Sermon on the Mount so well. I have studied it so much, read it throughout my life. But even when I wrote the book, The Journey, the Sermon on the Mount was one of the pinnacle passages where God was 
showing me, revealing to me that it's all about the heart. So I know it very well, but reading it in the message translation almost felt like I had never read it before. It was so in your face. I realized reading it that I still have so much to work on in my life if I want to live the life that Jesus has called us to live. I strive for that all the time, and I've been learning about it. And reading it in the Message Bible just, oh, it just hit me so hard in good ways and in bad ways where I was convicted. But I wanted to share this with you. So today's episode, I will be reading out of the Message Bible, the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5 through 7. And then over the next few weeks, we're going to break down the Sermon on the Mount There's a lot of historical, contextual, and cultural things to take into account. When we read up the Sermon on the Mount, we're not going to cover that here. I would love to set it up, set up the context. Who are they? Who was there? What was Jesus doing? Who was he speaking to? Matthew, who was the author? What is the purpose of his book and what was his focus? But we're not going to do any of that today. Today, we're just going to absorb ourselves in the actual sermon. We're going to read it. I'm going to take my time. And if you're an audible learner like me, you're going to find it helpful to hear the Sermon on the Mount in this translation that is different from conventional translations. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's worse. It was very uncomfortable for me. For someone who knows the Sermon on the Mount, and is used to reading it in conventional translations, it was awkward. I'm not going to lie, but it also helped me step out and search and pursue things within the Sermon on the Mount that I hadn't before. And it probably was because of the familiarity that I had with the passage. It just caused me to stop and think, question, ask myself things. So that's what we're going to do today. And then we'll break it down. And I already asked my husband to get prepared because next week he'll be a guest on the podcast. And we will talk about the Beatitudes, which is the first section of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, It's the passage that says, be blessed, you are blessed. And we're going to break it down. I asked him to study it. He has a teaching that he has done on the Beatitudes, relating it to the Old Testament, almost like a parallel that I found absolutely fascinating when I heard him teach this and have been fascinated ever since. And I don't think he's taught on it ever since that day. I've also recently heard a teaching on it that took it to a different perspective and I'm going to continue learning. So next week I told Mike, that we were going to do a podcast on this. And I said, you go do your research on the Beatitudes. I will do my research on the Beatitudes. We will study, we will pray, and then we will come together and have a live conversation about the Beatitudes. So next week, that's what we're going to do. We're going to dive deep into the Beatitudes within Matthew 5. I am a little congested right now, so don't mind that. Sometimes it's hard to breathe, (laughs) but I wanted to make sure I got this episode out today because next week I really want us to dive into the Beatitudes. So here we go. We're going to go Matthew 5 through 7. That's three chapters from the Message Bible where it says, when Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right Then you can see God in the outside world. 
You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds and know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors on this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in your world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together. Put it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky and the ground at your feet. Long after stars burn out and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Trivialize even the smallest item in God's law and you will only have trivialized yourself. But take it seriously. Show the way for others and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you're on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Or say you're on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even in jail. If that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. You know the next commandment pretty well too. Don't go to bed with another's spouse, but don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those ogling looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else be dumped on a moral trash, trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded for good in the dump. Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and her legal rights? Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you are legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress unless she has already made herself that by sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, 
you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask moral failure. And don't say anything you don't mean. This council is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you and never doing it, or saying God be with you and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, gift wrap the best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. You're familiar with the old written law, love your neighbor, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring the best out in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer, for then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone regardless, the good and bad, the nice and nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a meal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. You are kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. Be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. Playing the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it, quietly and unobtrusively. That is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. And when you come before God, don't turn that into theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for 15 minutes of fame. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do its best as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You are in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from the God's part. When you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go into training inwardly, Act normal outwardly. Shampoo and comb your hair, brush your teeth, wash your face. God doesn't require attention-getting devices. He won't overlook what you're doing. He'll reward you well.
Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money, both. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to the outward appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied to a job description, careless in the care of God, and you count far more to him than the birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, and do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting, so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come when the time comes. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures, criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly snare on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly snare off your own face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Don't be flip with the sacred. Banter and silliness give no honor to God. Don't reduce holy mysteries to slogans. In trying to be relevant, you're only being cute and inviting sacrilege. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This isn't a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. If your child asks you for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think that the God who conceived you in love will be even better? Here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and the prophet's and this is what you get. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot, dripping with practice sincerity. Chances are they are out to rip you off some way or other. Don't be impressed by charisma. Look for character. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions or your pocketbook. 
these diseased trees with their bad apples are going to get chopped down and burned. Knowing the correct password saying, like master, master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience, doing what my father wills. I can see it now. At the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preach the message. We bash the demons. Our super spiritual project had everyone talking. And do you know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to the standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved the house. It was fixed on the rock. But if you just use my words in the Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. When Jesus concluded his address, the crowds burst into applause. They had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying, quite a contrast to their religious teachers. This was the best teaching they had ever heard. And that concludes the Sermon on the Mount. I would love to give you some homework because I would love to understand your takeaway and your perspective. There is a theme in the Sermon of the Mount that pops out at me. And I wrote about this in my book, The Journey. I would love to hear what your takeaway is. When listening to the Sermon on the Mount, if you were to title it, so obviously not Sermon on the Mount, but if you were to title it, give it a sentence or a theme, summarize it up in one sentence or so, what is it that you're hearing? There's lots of different topics that are covered, lots of different examples, but there's an underlying theme that I keep hearing and I'm wondering if maybe you hear it too. So in your own words, I would love to hear what you come up with. What do you hear? You can email me at hello at andreajohn.com or you can private message me on any of my social media platforms. On Facebook, it's Journey with Andrea John. On all the other ones, it's at the Journey with Andrea I would just love to hear. If you're on YouTube, you can just comment below and let me know what's the theme that you're hearing in your own words. I would just, there's probably something I'm missing too. Just because there's one thing that's popping up doesn't mean it's the only thing. So as we prepare to break down the Sermon on the Mount over the next weeks, I would just love to hear from you. Maybe you need to go back and hear it again. Or maybe you want to go read it in your own, uh, in a different translation and more of a conventional translation. Again, I read it in this one because I was so used to hearing it in the conventional translations that hearing it in this language really caused me to pause and to think. And it convicted me in many ways that I still have so far to go to reflect the life that Jesus wants us to live. So thank you so much for joining me this week. I hope that the Sermon on the Mount blessed you as much as it blessed me. I would love to hear from you. So again, hello at andrejohn.com or private me on any of the social media apps. Until next week, Mike will be our guest. I will see you then. Have a great one. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Destiny Awaits. I hope the insights shared today have resonated with you and inspired you to take meaningful steps towards your destiny. Remember, your life is a journey. Embrace the challenges, celebrate the victories, and stay committed to living a life that reflects the image and likeness of God. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to Destiny Awaits on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube and leave a review. Your feedback fuels our mission to empower and encourage others like you on their path to living their best life. Until next time, keep
keep shining bright and living your destiny. This is Andrea signing off from Destiny Awaits. Take care and remember, your destiny awaits.